I leave it right here, right on time, you know, 7.20, and I'm gonna go ahead and go. I have a few slides that the team has prepared. And Dr. Mead, I am going to go ahead and uh, give you the platform, go for it. Thank you, Dr. Q. Uh, good morning, it is uh, an honor to introduce Dr. Sonnabend. Uh, Dr. Sonnabend is a native from Mexico City. He obtained his medical degree from the Faculty of Medicine at Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México which is one of the, it is the biggest uh, university in Latin America. Um, he graduated at top of his class, for which he was awarded the Gabino Barreda Medal from UNAM. Following his graduation, Dr. Sonaben worked in translational brain tumor research at the University of Chicago. He subsequently completed his neurosurgical training at, New, at the New York Presbyterian Co Hospital in Columbia University Medical Center where he obtained uh, extensive training in neurosurgical uh, oncology, in addition to his general neurosurgical training. He then uh, moved um, as an, to Northwestern Medicine as an associate professor of neurosurgery, and he is now a Turner Associate Professor and Director of Translational Neuro-Oncology at the Department of Neurosurgery at the Feinberg Fain School of Medicine at Northwestern. He is also chief of the Adam Sonnevin Laboratory, where they study uh, brain tumors. Uh, it's a basic and translational laboratory with a great uh, and very diverse group of scientists and physicians. As you can see here, he has uh, won many awards uh, and, and, and a lot of uh, honors throughout his career. Um, in 2015, uh, he won one of the 16 physician scientists and the only neurosurgeon um, award by the NIH. Um, if we, we go to the next one. Um, he's, um, he, he, he has published extensively and he has uh, given a lot to the medical literature, especially in brain tumors in translational science. His age index is 33. If you go to the next one, Dr. Q. And I know uh, that we at our laboratory uh, always look out for his papers as we learn a lot as our interests are similar. So we learn a lot from his papers and his contributions to the med medical literature. And we are very excited to have him um, uh, personally as a physician scientist. We, we are looking forward to uh, learning from him and he's gonna talk about um, the blood brain barrier and some of the challenges that we have for treating uh, GBM. Welcome, Dr. Sonnevin. And at a personal level, I just wanna say, I have been following Adam's career since he was working with Matt Lesniak in Chicago in the lab and then went to Columbia. And he is uh, an extraordinary, I mean, you can see his age in this, an extraordinary superstar. Very early on, immediately after residency, got NIH funding and you'll see the quality of work. He just recently had a major paper at a major journal. I'm sure we're gonna hear a little bit about that as well. But he's just a, an amazing human being, just a, a father, a husband, a friend. I see him interacting with people, humble. You know, I've been in, in several study sessions. This is, we're cracking jokes in the background because some of the study sessions that we attend had to do with neuroimmunology and both of us are brain tumor surgeons and we're cracking jokes in the background, but it's just a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to work with you in your clinical neuroimmunology and brain tumor study section. And I got to know him better and better. And of course, follow your career. Tremendous superstar. Take it away, Adam, please. Thank you. I, I One more word, if uh, you hear me. First of all, thank you, Paula. That was a very generous introduction. And, and, and Dr. Quinones for this amazing opportunity to speak here. I do know and feel the, the halo of the Mayo Clinic in Florida. And I keep hearing about these wonderful things. I hope this is not a substitute for an eventual visit, but on the other hand, I do want to acknowledge uh, their friendship over the many years. I, I do remember Dr. Quinones when I was interviewing for residency back in the day. So it's always uh, fantastic to have friends uh, across the country. <laughs> do you guys see my screen? Yes, we see it oh. perfectly. Very good. So I, I, I want to apologize a little bit. I hope this is not too ambitious of a talk, but I'm going to throw at you the whole kitchen sink. And I'm gonna to try to marry different themes with the common goal of figuring out what are the challenges to, to do effective translational brain tumor research and, and what have I at least done about it. Um, 
uh, conflict of interest, there, there are several things I'll discuss today that are off label, as well as several things that we have filed as uh, patents by Northwestern related to some of the things discussed. Nothing has been licensed. So I, I'll start by, by talking about my humble position as an academic brain tumor researcher. And, you know, the first thing I want to say is it's really daunting, uh, but to develop a new drug and say, hey, why don't we use this new agent or, or why don't we just come up with a new structure of a chemical compound and eventually uh, let it to approval through clinical trials, you should know what you're getting into. It, it's basically a, a, on average a $2.6 billion um, enterprise and the chance of succeeding are less than 12%. 15 up to 20 years to do this. So I personally don't have a, a life and, and a career that it can, and, and a budget that can, can probably support uh, these, uh, not even one. So I think this is not really a good strategy, at least in my case, uh, as a translational uh, research scientist. People might do better than me, but I, I feel this, this is really difficult. Uh, some uh, People might dwell in a portion of this uh, journey to develop a compound or to the do the first clinical trial, but to go through the whole thing, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult. One of the other challenges that people should be aware of is what happens between uh, the moment when you come up with an idea and the moment when a clinical trial turns out to basically be negative. And, and, and this is what I think is happening a lot on the field behind the scenes. And this is how I really think uh, investigators often act, right? So there's three stages, if you think about it, the stage that I would call trial and error, sweat and tears. Basically, you take all the possible in vitro and in vivo tumor models, cell lines, PDX lines, intracranial implant models, transgenic models, and you try your therapy. And basically, you, for the most part, your results are negative, but eventually you find one situation with one concentration and one of the models in which you do see some kind of uh, efficacy in a preclinical model. Uh, that might be through viability, cytotoxicity, immune response, tumor size, luciferase signal, you, you hang on to whatever shows some promise. And then you get to the second stage where you curate a story and you publish a paper. And then uh, you move on and, and, and you get to the point where the publication is out and then you wonder, well, you know, if it works in, in preclinical models, what stops you from getting into a clinical trial? But you should be aware that there's a, an amount of bias that is tremendous uh, with regards to every negative result you had along the way with this, this concept that doesn't really go into a publication for the most part. So I think that's a problem. And then you get to the clinical stage of the project where you say, okay, let's come up with a clinical trial. And, and eventually these clinical trials led to a randomized clinical trial. And, and the usual, the, I would say the, the template for these clinical trials is the hypothesis where they say, all right, well, drug X uh, will have some modest efficacy in all patients. Those on average patients that are treated with this drug will live slightly longer than those that did not get the drug. And the result of the trial almost always is uh, with one exception that I can think maybe, is, uh, well, you know, the trial for drugs X uh, failed to meet the clinical endpoint as on average, there were no differences yet. And the yet is really what, what keeps us going. Uh, start all over again. You know, the investigators observed that some of the treated patients had radiographic response or stability of the tumors. And, you know, some patients live very long. And then you get into the post hoc hypothesis, basically. Does it have to do with whether their zip code was uh, odd versus even? Uh, people who have younger sisters tend to live longer. You know, it, the post hoc hypothesis can be as uh, nuanced as, as you like. Sometimes this post hoc hypothesis might make sense and there's, there's a way to enrich for the population of patients that do live longer, right? So, so I think really there are two pillars in my mind to repurpose a drug for glioblastoma. And when I mean repurpose a drug for glioblastoma is as an academic translational brain tumor researcher uh, or neurosurgeon, how do I avoid developing a new drug 
and how do you just take a drug off the shelf and really apply it to glioblastoma patients? And, and I think the two pillars that I'd like to discuss today, one is patient selection to, to address some of the biases and the, and the hypotheses that just seem to be really getting in the way of, of finding an efficacy signal. And the other one is drug delivery. Let's start with patient selection. The, the question here is whether smart patient selection can reveal the therapeutic efficacy of drugs that already failed in clinical trials. And the idea is that not all tumors are equal and average survival for all treated, it's really not informative. And here's a, a good example of this idea. You know, as you know, there's been failure after failure with clinical trials looking at immune checkpoint blockade for glioblastomas. There's all these clinical trials, yet there's several studies that clearly show that a subset of patients do benefit from this. And I, I here show you some of the work that we have done, uh, but several other groups have also described this. Yet the randomized control trials are completely negative. This is a, a review that was uh, put together by Victor, a, a postdoc in my lab, who, who's also from Mexico, by the way. And so this is one of the studies that, that we uh, put together. This is in collaboration. I did this with, with my friend Raul Rabadan, a fantastic investigator at Columbia. He's, he's a, a computational biologist. And we published this in Nature Medicine back in 2019. And, and I did also this with Fabio Wimoto, who's a, a fantastic neuro-oncologist at Columbia. And basically, this represents my initial years in practice as a brain tumor surgeon. And I would call this the Wild West. Uh, why? Well, it was a stage uh, where I just joined practice and I had mainly uh, was assigned to deal with all the recurrent glioblastomas. And a lot of them, I would just go in and do a resection. But as you all know, you know, cytoreduction reduction and a recurrent glioblastoma, it's very controversial to offer really a true benefit in the context of prolonging survival. And we didn't really know what to do with these patients. And at that time, several people were getting novel prices for immune checkpoint blockade. Uh, you know, President Carter, had, his life had just been saved in the context of melanoma. There was also all this amazing uh, revolution in, in oncology. And there were no negative data uh, for PD-1 blockade in glioblastoma. So, but there was no positive data either. So what we would do is just systematically operate and put everybody on PD-1 blockade. And more often than not, we would get disappointed. But occasionally we would see something that we really thought would be a response. And so at some point we got systematic about it. By the time we started doing these, all these negative trials started coming out. And what we wanted to do is just to characterize in an unbiased way, what makes these patients that respond different than the ones that uh, do not respond. And so this was a retrospective study. Um, we had 66 patients, including 17 that we uh, thought were responders. The way we defined response was basically more than six months of stable disease uh, from the beginning of, of PD-1 blockade. Or uh, maybe there's a growing lesion, but we would go in and do surgery and the pathology would reveal scan to no tumor cells and just heavy uh, lymphocytic infiltrate. And so when you do that, um, we then went ahead and, and studied variables such as demographics, uh, uh, therapy, imaging, survival, gene expression, genetic and histological features of these tumors. Um, and so what you will see here, even though the definition of response was not involving survival, actually our definition of response was the most significant determinant of survival in these recurrent glioblastomas. It was way more important than whether they had steroids, whether they had uh, alkylating agents, age, temodar, tumor treating fields. If, if the patients were deemed to be responders, they would just have a longer survival. So we thought this definition of response was tangible, was real, was worth uh, studying at the molecular level. And so here I'll show you two cases. Uh, you know, I finished writing this paper with that Northwestern, so I also included some Northwestern patients, but here you can see this is uh, patient seven at Northwestern and had a tumor. Uh, it started PD-1 blockade and, and two months later, tumor was growing. Uh, but then patient uh, 11 had basically uh, this tumor and kept on getting treatment for 17 months without ever exhibiting growth. This is already at the recurrent glioblastomas. You know, the median survival for these patients about nine to 11 months. So 
for a patient to not exhibit growth for 17 months, we thought this was a good uh, responder. Um, and so when we did exome sequencing, we found two major findings. One is that P10 uh, alterations was really uh, overrepresented in the non-responders. But the other really interesting thing is that these two mutations, BRAF and PTPN11, which are two mutations that are known already to activate MAP kinase signaling, were overrepresented in the responders. And this is when you compare responders versus all the TCGI tumors, or when you compare responders to the non-responder group. So these were two separate mutations that are very rare. They're really found in two to 3% of all glioblastomas, but they were found tenfold more likely to be in the responder patients. And they were in 30% of the responders. And as you know, uh, these two are upstream on the MAP kinase signaling cascade. PTPN11 is a phosphatase that activates the signaling and BRAF also activates the MAP kinase uh, signaling. Downstream from this, you have things like uh, ERK and, and P38 that, that, that really are effectors of this pathway. And when they get phosphorylated, they um, get activated. So we had discovered that uh, these two mutations were overrepresented in the responders, but we're far away from identifying responder patients because these were only present in 30% of the responders. And this is a, honestly a very anticlimactic um, biomarker. If you go and tell somebody, I'm gonna do a test and you are two to 3% likely to have a positive answer. And uh, you know, if your result of the test is negative, you could fall in the 70% of the patients who still benefit. That's really a terrible biomarker, but it was a clue. And so then I took on this uh, effort, and this is work again done by Victor, my, my postdoc, who, by the way, Alfredo is applying for neurosurgery this year, um, who also graduated from UNAM. And, and, and Victor and I started thinking, okay, well, so if these two mutations are hinting that MAP kinase can get activated and the responders, what if we just look at the downstream effector of MAP kinase, ERK, 1 and 2 phosphorylation? And, and this is what we did. And let me show you a little bit of what we found here. There's a lot of technical aspects to this paper that I might just bypass for, for sake of time, but you can always see how we, we did this. It's, it's now published. The first thing I'll tell you is we started doing immunostochemistry for phosphor ERK in the tumor regions. And what you can see here, the definition of response versus non-response was significantly different. It's interesting because there were some non-responders that had elevated ERK, but there were no responders that had low ERK. In other words, if you have um, elevated ERK, you might or might not be a responder, but if you have low ERK, there's no way you would be a responder. And here I'll show you another case of mine. This is one of my uh, initial cases when I arrived to Colombia. This was an enormous uh, you know, left frontal glioblastoma, you can see here, and at some point, uh, I was, this is a recurrent glioblastoma. I did go in and did a, a major resection. And this patient turned out to have a BRAF mutation. And as you can see, the phosphorylated ERK is, is really strongly staining. And the patient started PD-1 blockades. And 10 months later, patient developed this horrendous uh, hydrocephalus. Uh, I, I put a ventricular drain and, and turned out that the fluid was so viscous, it was really difficult to, to shunt this patient. And we did flow cytometry analysis and turns out that the CSF was just a soup of lymphocyte. There was CD4 and CD8 uh, T cells. Uh, in, in the process of doing this, eventually I shunted the patient and I got a biopsy of this right caudate head and right frontal lesion. And when I did that, we took it to the pathologist and, and they said, well, there's really no tumors, there's only lymphocytes. And we again did flow cytometry in it and we found CD4 and CD8 T cells. So this is a very, very clear example of a responder patient with a BRAF mutation that had a PR staining. And in contrast, this is another patient that had a resection. Um, this patient was then put on Avastin and started PD1 blockade two months later, progressed, and six months later was passed away. And this is clearly a non-responder patient. The, the ERK uh, phosphorylation was very low. You might ask yourself, well, ERK phosphorylation, the phosphoprotein, uh, it's actually very unstable. How do we know that this is truly a low ERK versus a degraded specimen? And so one thing we, we got in the habit of doing is <clears throat> 
looking at the endothelium. Turns out the endothelium always stands for PRG. So every sample that has endothelium has an internal control built in. And so you can see this patient had low PRG also has a lot of PRG in the endothelium. So it's truly a biological difference. It's not really a degradation of the specimen. So when we did this, when we said, well, let's just actually just uh, measure PRG in all these patients and see what survival looks like. And, and I'll show you here, we had two cohorts in this case, a, a core that got PD-1 blockade and a core that did not get PD-1 blockade. And what you can see right here in red is this is the core that got PD-1 blockade that had elevated PRG divided by the median. But the other cohorts, the high PRG with no immunotherapy, the low PRG with immunotherapy, the low PRG with no immunotherapy, they all clustered together. So it was clearly showing that this is a predictive biomarker, not a prognostic biomarker. Uh, another way to think about this, which is also really interesting, we were trying to get at how do we identify the patients that don't have the PR mutation, they, they don't have the BRAF mutation, uh, and the question was, do they also have elevated PR? And it was really interesting. We're now suddenly discovering the other 70% of the patients that didn't have the mutations. To be uh, succinct about this, it's just like thinking all roads lead to Rome, Rome being MAP kinase activation. It might be through mutations or by another means. But turns out, uh, you know, all the responders had elevated PR, as you can see on this graph, right? You have here a patient that had the BRAF mutation, had elevated PR. This a patient had the wild, wild type BRAF, uh, but also had elevated PR. And these patients live more than 12 months from PD1 blockade initiation. And these other patients had wild type uh, BRAF and had very low PR. I was very excited about this. Then I, I reached out to Roger Stoop, who's a very close friend and collaborator. And he's got this uh, very scientific, uh, skeptical attitude towards everything. He said, okay, you did this once, that's, that's cute, but you, you really have to do it twice to convince me. And out of, I didn't really know how to get more of these specimens. So I reached out to my colleagues at UCLA that had just published another paper, Nature Medicine, along with mine. And they had a clinical trial in which they had a, a subset of patients that were treated with adjuvant PD-1 blockade. So I got their specimens. And I stained them, and this is the survival curve I got. Yeah, this is all overall survival. We're not going by, by uh, progression-free survival. And so I was able to replicate these findings, and Victor was very excited. And we put that on, 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 on the paper. Um, and then the question is, well, why is that? Is there something different about the microenvironment in these cases? And the first question we answer is, which are the cells that are actually phosphorylated for ERK. And we did multiplex immunofluorescence and we found that the vast majority of the cells that had elevated ERK in phosphorylation were SOX2 positive cells, which are presumed to be tumor cells. There's contribution from other cell types, but mostly came from tumor cells. You can see here SOX2 positive PR positive cells are higher in the patients that have elevated PR by immunostochemistry than the ones that have low. But the other interesting thing we found is that there's more microglia in those tumors. The TMM119 is, is a marker for microglia, and you can see there's much more microglia when patients have elevated PR than when they don't. CD163 is a marker for myeloid cells, and we really didn't find any difference between myeloid cells uh, among PR high versus low, but, but microglia we did, and here's, here's a nice correlation between IBA1 and, and PR across patients. Um, here you can see the, the, the different markers. This is basically the analysis of these kinds of pictures that, that we're showing you right here. And you can see in this region, immunostochemistry for PR, immunostochemistry for IPA1 shows a very nice overlap. So, so the PR cells uh, tend to be tumor cells and they tend to be surrounded by microglia. Um, and so then the question is, well, is there something special about this microglia? And, and, and to get at that, what we did is we did a PERD analysis where we took samples uh, and we quantify phosphorylated uh, ERK by immunostochemistry, just like we did for survival, but we also had single cell RNA sequencing data on the same sample. And so when we did this, we divided uh, these 10 samples into five that were high PR using the same cutoff and five that were low PR. And what we learned is that their microglia was really different between these two. The main difference, you can see all these differences, these are gene ontology themes that are enriched by elevated micro, uh, PR on the microglia. 
the most important uh, uh, gene ontology theme was this MHC class two complex. Uh, so the genes necessary for MHC class two type antigen presentation were upregulated in the microglia of patients that had high PR that were exhibiting longer survival following PD-1 blockade. And we thought this was interesting here. You can see the, the human plot of all the uh, cells. And we, you see how we focus on the myeloid cell component. And within the myeloid cell component, you have here the high PR is the region down here. And the uh, cells that have elevated MHC class two are also down here. So they tend to be the same. This is a GSCA plot that people might be familiar with showing the ranking of the genes for MHC class two according to, to elevated versus low PR. Um, but then we said, okay, this works in RNA. It's good practice to make sure that things that look nice on RNA also turn out to be uh, uh, actually corresponding in the same way with protein. So we did again, multiplex staining on these specimens. And what we did is a staining for TMN119, which shows microglia and a staining for MHC class two, which you can see right here in white. So this is a patient with high PR and this patient with low PR. You can see the patient with high PR has much more white. And we quantify this across all these specimens. And it's clear that in the context of TMN119, there's much more MHC class two uh, proteins in the microglia than in the low PR. Uh, but this is really much less so in the, in the context of CD163, uh, maybe bone marrow derived myeloid cells. So there's something really unique about the microglia uh, of these patients. Uh, maybe they're more likely to present antigens. So this is, I think, really nice, but let's, let's, uh, let's be uh, hold on, um, critical, uh, self-critical, right? So, so MAP kinase and ERK are associated with response to PD-1 blockade, but let's be scientific about this. Does that mean that MAP kinase leads to response uh, to tumor recognition by T cells and PD-1 blockade? Well, you would hope so, but that's not necessarily the case, right? And, and we have to distinguish what I think is correlation versus causation. And, and, and to put a nice cartoon that I found preparing this talk, correlation, an example is 100% of people who breathe die, clearly. Causation is 100% of people who do not breathe die. Right, so it might seem the opposite, but it's, it's really important to make this distinction, right? And so we wanted to study that because eventually in order to come up with a, a meaningful biomarker, we all feel like we need to have a biomarker that has a good correlation with outcome, but also has causation, has, has a, a, a contribution mechanistically speaking. And the way we think of doing that uh, usually is to take gene expression or protein expression, correlating that with susceptibility, we have done this in vitro, we have done this in vivo, we have done this with survival in, in patient data sets, but also do a large scale uh, interrogation of the genome and every gene with CRISPR by removing the gene and seeing how that affects uh, the, the viability of cells when they get the treatment. So that way we get a, a biomarker that is causal and correlative. Now I'm moving on to discuss some work by, by a stellar postdoc of mine, Chris Mita. She's outstanding. Watch out for her. She, she might be the first uh, independent researcher and, and PI that comes out of my lab, and I'm, I'm very excited about her. And so I'm showing you here, she did this very elegant experiment. She, she, we were very interested in the, in the kinome because MAP kinases, they're all kinases, obviously. And so she took a library of all the kinases in the genome in mice. There's about... Um, 3,000 uh, guides here because every kinase was represented by four different guide RNAs, so 700 kinases that she knocked out. One gene per cell, about 1,000 cells per gene, per guide, I'm sorry. And so she, she did all this library of uh, cells, combination of uh, mouse glioma cells with different knockouts, and she implanted this into two kinds of mice, mice that had CD8 T cells and mice that were knockout for CD8 T cells. And then she just let them be. And when the mice were dying, she collected their tumors and she did a PCR barcoding and she sequenced all of these. And she just started looking at what are the guide distribution? Are there some guys that are more likely to survive or, or clones are more likely to survive if you have T cells versus if you do not have or vice versa. And what we learned is that basically the MAP kinase knockout 
cells were more abundant when the mice had CD8 T cells when, than when they did not. And some of the things that we found right here, for instance, is MEK2, ERK7, ERK2, ARAF. We didn't find BRAF, but we found ARAF in this case, uh, MEK1, ERK4. And you, just to remind you of the pathway, you have RAS, the phosphorylase uh, RAF, MEK1, both phosphorylate MEK2, and that phosphorylates ERK. And so I think you can see here, she had a 100 non-targeting controls that behave like this. So you can clearly see that there was an enrichment of MAP kinase knockouts for CD8 T cells. In other words, MAP kinase signaling might be an intrinsic oncogenic signal in, in tumor cells, but it's inconvenient with, when, when tumor cells want to avoid uh, T cell recognition. So I think this is some evidence of causality. So moving away from PD-1 blockade immunotherapy, Chris Mita has a different project, which is the personalized use of chemotherapy. The question here is, yeah, I mean, you can think about predictive biomarkers for targeted therapies like, you know, I don't know, EGFR, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors and things like that. But what about standard chemotherapy that is not thought to be that targeted? Can you personalize its use? And, and, and she has done this work with just, I'm excited to share it, we just published this in Clinical Cancer Research uh, actually last week, uh, where she studied what determines uh, susceptibility to paclitaxel uh, for glioblastomas and breast cancer. And why paclitaxel? Well, first of all, it's one of the most potent drugs for glioblastomas. And it's another effort I have to repurpose the drug for these tumors, super potent. Um, you can see it right here on the left, uh, the IC50 for paclitaxel is uh, really, really low compared to temozolomide and, and other uh, drugs uh, you can see right here. It's roughly about 1400 fold more potent than temozolomide for these tumors. The other interesting thing is that paclitaxel is as potent for glioblastomas as it is for cancer for which it's already approved like lung cancer, pancreas cancer and breast cancer. So it's a great drug for uh, gliomas in the context of potency. Yet it's really interesting in breast cancer, where it's the standard of care, as well as in glioblastoma, there's roughly a third to half of all cell lines that we could evaluate that, that simply will never respond. The other half are very likely to respond. Just go through the mental exercise of thinking, if you do a clinical trial and you do it randomized and you don't have a biomarker, you're flipping a coin whether your trial is positive depending on which patients are fall in which arm, right? Has nothing to do with whether the fact that you can help some of these patients, but if the distribution of susceptible versus resistant patients is unfavorable, you will have a negative trial. So, so this is the problem I have with the, the, the traditional thinking of randomized controlled trials. Um, and so she now became a CRISPR screen master and she did this really interesting genome-wide CRISPR screen. She basically knocked out every gene in the genome. Um, again, four different guides per gene, uh, about uh, 1,000 cells per, per guide. And she did this in the most susceptible cell line we could find. And it's really interesting. If you think about it, this is the growth pattern over uh, 24 days uh, when you have the screen. So when you give DMSO, the cells just keep expanding forever. When you give paclitaxel, there's a selection phase in which you're basically killing all the susceptible cells, but there's some clones at some point that just hover and survive. And once you get rid of the susceptible ones, these are hovering while you stay on paclitaxel selection pressure. At some point, these cells just start growing. And this expansion phase is, is really what we hope to see in order to really enrich for the resistant clones. And then we go in and sequence them and we find out what these are, right? So what genes, removing what genes in the genome will make cells survive paclitaxel treatment? This is really the question she, she, she was investigating here. And you can see there's several uh, genes. She came up with about 50 genes out of 20,000. She came up with 50 genes. But that will give you causality. But again, as I was saying, we, we really care about correlation and causality. And we don't have correlation data in gliomas, but we have correlation data in breast cancer. So we took a, a leap of faith and we said, well, maybe there's something in common between breast cancer and gliomas. And so what we did is we said, okay, let's take data set. Breast cancer is awesome because everybody gets a biopsy before starting treatment that you just pop a needle into the breast uh, lesion and, and do that. So there's a lot of data sets that have 
gene expression and have treatment and have outcomes in breast cancer. And so here I actually uh, want to acknowledge my brother. He was doing a PhD in statistics and I got free labor and I asked him to do this analysis for us. And basically the analysis we did was an interaction analysis. The question is, which of these 50 genes correlates with survival and with progression-free survival in breast cancer patients only when they got toxins, but not when they did not. Does that make sense? Because I don't want a prognostic biomarker. I want a gene that is elevated and patients do well only when they get paclitaxel that I already know by CRISPR that if I remove it, the cells turn resistant. And so here I show you SSR3 was the, the gene that had the best interaction coefficient. Uh, we have several other cues, but SSR3 was the, this gene in that context. And I'm just showing you here the two data sets that we played with. When you, for this, uh, the analysis was done in, in a continuous way, meaning every increment of expression should lead to an increment in survival. We're not really artificially cutting the data in any given way in order to make the statistics uh, happen. But for the purposes of, of showing you the survival curve, we cut the data by, by the middle of expression, right? So you always see similar numbers of patients with high and low. And you can see here, toxin treated patients had longer overall survival when they had elevated XSR3. The untreated patients had no difference and the overall TCGA breast cancer patients also had no difference. Um, here's a different data set. Taxon treated patients um, shows longer survival probability. Uh, this one is for relapse free survival above, and this is a different data set that only had overall survival. And, and so when you see untreated patients, no difference. Treat, patients treated with other uh, drugs that are not taxanes, no difference and overall breast cancer and glioblastoma patients have no difference in survival when you look at SSR3. <laughs> so that's what we mean by, by um, predictive, not, not prognostic. So then we got into the uh, preclinical validation aspect of this, right? So Chris Mita quantified SSR3 uh, in glioma cell lines by Western blood, and she determined susceptibility uh, by area under the curve using those response curves, and she found a good correlation uh, even with a, a few cell lines that we tried with SSR3, she did the same thing with breast cancer. And she also found what I would say is a, a trend for a correlation. This wasn't statistically significant, but we already had very high significance with hundreds of actually 3000 breast cancer patients. So the fact that we didn't get a significance here didn't really bother us that much. There was a trend. Then we went in vivo and wanted to know whether this would translate in vivo. And what we did is we we implanted uh, patient-derived xenografts uh, from gliomas, and we treated them with, with paclitaxel. You can see the, here there's four different survival curves, and the staining for these, this, this is a, the, the, the xenograft that had the highest expression of SSR3. You can see there's a survival benefit, and it seems to be incremental. And the most resistant ones uh, had very little survival benefit. This is shown by immunostochemistry as well as by Western blot. Um, and so the question is, does it actually contribute to response? And we had seen the CRISPR screen result, but then we, she actually went ahead and knocked it out. And when you knock it out, the cells turn resistant to paclitaxel. This is the case in glioma cells and in breast cancer cells and the PDX line. She did the opposite experiment where she took a resistant uh, PDX line and she overexpressed SSR3 and the cells became susceptible. And so she proved that susceptibility was also uh, found to be uh, correlated with, I mean, not correlated caused by, by SSR3. She did this in vivo. You can see these cells express very little SSR3. When she overexpressed it, she got, I would call a modest but significant increase in survival. So I don't want to oversimplify the story. There might be more genes that contribute to susceptibility. This is not a phenomenal, you know, all mice are cured result, but there's clearly a contribution from this gene. She did the same thing in, in mammary pad implants uh, for breast uh, uh, tumors, and she found uh, the same finding. When you knock out SSR3, the, the, the tumors basically stop responding to paclitaxel. So I, I hope I convince you that patient selection, it's, it's everything when it comes to finding an efficacy signal in glioblastoma. It, we all know that not all tumors are equal, but we keep pretending that they are when it comes to clinical trials. 
And this, uh, you know, flawed view is what I think leads to most negative clinical trials. But the other pillar to repurposing drugs is drug delivery. And so staying with paclitaxel that I hope I convince you is a highly potent drug for gliomas. Why is it not being used? It turns out several people have already done this. Uh, there are several studies, one including uh, uh, by Susan Chan, that they already tested paclitaxel and gliomas. There's phase, trial, uh, 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 phase two clinical trial data, and it really doesn't work. The only exception to that was this uh, study that came out of Israel where they did convection enhanced delivery for paclitaxel. And it was interesting, it was 15 patients, there was a 73% res uh, response rate. So that's, I would say, pretty high. The problem there is that they had all the convection hands delivery complications. You can expect chemical meningitis, infections complications, and neurological deterioration. So this was really not feasible to be used as convection enhanced delivery. At the time where this study was done, there was only one formulation for paclitaxel in the world. This is paclitaxel that had this vehicle uh, called cramophore or castor oil. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. <coughs> but there was also a study that did pharmacokinetics. And basically, they would give paclitaxel to patients and they would go in and measure the paclitaxel levels in the CSF and cis fluids and the brain and in the tumor. And it turns out <clears throat> it's really not detectable in the brain. You might see it in the tumor, but it's not in the brain for sure. So you have a very potent drug that doesn't work, that does work when you give it through convection enhanced delivery, but that just clearly is not getting across the blood brain barrier. And why is this important? This is a scan of one of my patients. You can see I can do a very nice resection and, and, and it's really nice for the self-esteem to see a clean looking scan post-op, but uh, we shouldn't fool ourselves. We know that this is a tumor bulk and this is the brain and you have tumor cells in the brain and they could be far away beyond what we consider uh, uh, the limits of our resection. And this is ultimately the, the reason why uh, you know, resections are not long lasting as a, as a way to control tumor growth. There's about 80 to 90% chance of recurrence within the two centimeters adjacent to resection cavity. So the blood brain barrier is really a major impediment in the case of paclitaxel and about 98% of the drugs out there. And the blood brain barrier is a really interesting structure just to briefly touch on. This is also a, a chapter that Victor put together. He's really good doing cartoons. You know, it has this mechanical aspect to it where, where tight junctions don't let anything uh, slide between uh, endothelial cells, but it also has a molecular aspect to it where any molecule that gets popped out, it's, it's just, uh, you know, pumped back into the circulation. And so for these, we, we have been exploring the use of uh, ultrasound as a way to open the blood brain barrier. And this is a field that is about 15 years old. It was a uh, started by, by this investigator, brilliant guy, Kulervo Hyunian. He was at the time at Harvard. He's currently at the University of Toronto. And he discovered that when you actually inject microbubbles intravenously, these microbubbles are already FDA approved. They're the contrast agent of choice for cardiac echo, uh, uh, echoes. They're, they're very safe. Um, when you inject these microbubbles and they are going through the capillaries, if you hit them with sound waves, they will oscillate and burst and mechanically disrupt the blood brain barrier. And it's really interesting. It worked really nice in preclinical models. Translating these to patients would require that the sound waves either go through the skull or the transcranial approaches uh, or will bypass the skull, right? And so now I'm work talking about the, the work of a, another a dear medical student of mine, Dan Sang, who's also applying to neurosurgery very soon. And so I was very interested in this. And I said, Dan, let's take this ultrasound system and try paclitaxel. And Dan said, well, there's two paclitaxel formulations. Which one do I use? And I wasn't really thinking very seriously about this. I said, I don't know, why don't you try both? And so he compared both. And there was a big surprise I'll share with you in a minute. The system in mice looks like this. You put the mouse on, on its back and you can inject the drug and your micro bubbles and you sonicate and you open the blood brain barrier. And, and we also have been injecting fluorescein. As a clinician, I use fluorescein all the time. 
to find uh, enhancing tumor. It's, it, it's what I use to guide my surgery, just like some people use 5-ALA, I use fluorescein. So I'm well aware that fluorescein doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. It would only show enhancing disease. So we were using fluorescein as a surrogate to know that I was opening the blood-brain barrier. And so Dan got this to work really well in mice. You can see here the fluorescence of the fluorescein in a mouse that he sonicated the brain. And this other one didn't have a sonication, doesn't have any fluorescein. And we measure both fluorescein and paclitaxel across biopsies. And he found a really nice correlation between these two. So we thought we had a system and we thought we have a way to map and visualize fluorescence, uh, uh, blood brain barrier opening. And so Dan started doing this and then started measuring. And it turns out that he had multiple fold increase in paclitaxel uh, when he was using the ultrasound and when he wasn't. You should know this, this model and these experiments are done without any tumor. Because what we're trying to do is to model the peritumoral brain where the blood brain barrier is intact. So really a matter of delivery, there's no great mouse tumor models for, for looking at this. The best mouse tumor model is no tumor. Um, but he compared both formulations, the formulation where paclitaxel is bound to albumin and the, and the old formulation where paclitaxel is bound to cremaphore or castor oil. And it turns out that one that is bound to albumin for whatever reason is getting in much better. <clears throat> the other interesting thing that he noticed is that the concentrations we're getting were enough to kill the 50% of the cell lines that were susceptible. So it seems like we were getting therapeutic concentrations. Um, then he did the survival study, as you can expect, we had some benefit, but the benefit was marginally better. Is This is what I would call a pathetic yet significant improvement, right? And, and so there's a good, uh, saying out there, it's, uh, uh, it was coined by a famous statistician saying, all models are bad. All models are wrong, but some are useful. So here we took a PDX model and we show an improvement in survival. We're disappointed survival wasn't any better, but when you look at the histology, turns out this tumor model doesn't have any blood brain barrier uh, problems. Meaning, the tumor grows as a meatball. It has its own vessels that don't have any blood brain barrier, but the tumor never infiltrates the brain where the blood brain barrier is intact. So we were hoping that we might actually get better results in patients than we were getting in this model from the ultrasound. The other interesting thing that Dan did is just compare the toxicity without any tumor of both formulations. And it was really interesting. I'll show you right here. When you do a paclitaxel with cremaphore, half of the mice were dying after a few doses. When we did cremaphore alone without any paclitaxel, equal number of mice were dying. Yet when you give paclitaxel with albumin, no mice were dying to the point where we could double the dose. And so it was really interesting discovery that toxicity that we were seeing was related to the vehicle, not to, to paclitaxel per se. You should understand paclitaxel is a microtubule inhibitor, and it's one of the main side effects is peripheral neuropathy. So people were very concerned about us getting it into the brain because they say if it, it damages peripheral neurons, it's likely going to have central neurotoxicity. And, but we discovered that for the most part, the neurotoxicity was the vehicle, not the paclitaxel per se. So based on that, we thought we wanted to take this to a clinical trial. And for that, we used this system. He had been recently published by Alex Carpentier, a good friend of mine. He's the chairman of neurosurgery in Paris at La Sorbonne. <clears throat> and Alex had this great idea and he founded a company. He said, you know, for sound waves to go through the skull, it's just too complicated. You need a huge MRI. There are systems like this. Inside Tech has one. You have to have a $4 million MRI machine coupled to an ultrasound device. You need to shave the patient's head. Procedure takes four hours. Um, I mean, it works, but it's difficult to scale up. You can't do this in thousands of patients at the community center in an infusion suite every week. This is going to be very difficult to say, what if I just put the ultrasound in a window in the skull? And that way the energy can be low. This is the same energy that is used for diagnostic ultrasounds. Uh, and it's predictable. You know, when the sound waves go through the skull, they start doing things that are funny. They go in tangential ways. So he did this and he designed this implantable ultrasound that sits on a burr hole and you connect it with a needle to a pulse generator and this was really smart 
I remember I read this paper when I was still at Columbia and I was like, I really want to do this. This is very exciting. And he determined what's the uh, sonication parameters, the power that you needed to get good blood brain barrier opening. And the way he and most people would look at blood brain barrier opening is by getting an MRI with contrast before and getting a new MRI with contrast right after sonication. So any gadolinium you see after, but not before, would really show that you're getting blood brain barrier opening. And so here's one of the uh, uh, pictures of one of his papers. You can see there's the probe right here and you, you have all this enhancement targeting all the way to the patient's thalamus. It, it goes really deep, but we all knew this wasn't really exciting in the context of glioblastomas because this is a single probe. You know, there's almost no patient that has such a small field of peritumoral brain. Um, things got interesting when they designed the second generation ultrasound. And this second generation ultrasound is a grid of nine ultrasounds. It's a six by six centimeter grid uh, loaded into a titanium mesh. So basically the idea is you would do a craniotomy and you would uh, implant this instead of putting the bone back. And then you can percutaneously access the port with the needle and open the blood brain barrier in the clinic uh, whenever you like. And so I got to play with this. At the time where we started doing this, uh, Roger and I sat down, uh, Roger Stoop and I sat down and we said, well, where is the field right here? And there were several clinical trials open uh, using ultrasounds for blood brain barrier delivery across uh, delivery of drugs across the blood brain barrier. At that point, it was clear that this was a safe approach, that it was feasible, that people were getting blood brain barrier disruption, and that you could do this repeatedly. What was not known at the time is uh, what would happen if you expand the field of sonication to achieve a large volume. It wasn't known what actually are the drug levels when you do this in the human brain. All the, all the PK data, pharmacokinetic data was done in animals, but we didn't really know if we we're getting therapeutic levels in the human brain. And, and people were just showing MRIs, which is nice, but not, it's indirect. We wanted to know, can we actually get enough drug in there to make this meaningful? And the other thing is it was very difficult to jump between different drugs. Every time you needed to do a, a complete new IND, every time you try a different drug. And so we wanted to address these three problems. And so we started our own clinical trial. It was a phase one clinical trial. <clears throat> and the clinical trial had this uh, uh, device, as, as I mentioned, it's a grade of nine ultrasounds with the, uh, with the needle to connect it to a pulse generator. Here's a CT scan of one of my patients. You can see the staples here for, for the post-op scan. This represents the wound. Um, and the ultrasound is underneath the skin. And this is how it's uh, implanted. This was really exciting. I did my first implant as part of a, a different clinical trial from them using carboplatin. I did this really two weeks before the lockdown. Uh, this is the first implant ever done outside of France. And right after that, the lockdown started, but I had treated the first patient. You can see here, I, I made a window in, in, in the uh, bone and I left the ultrasound. This is the bone flap that was kept outside. This is a, an X-ray that shows how this implant looks like. And so then we moved on to <coughs> start our own clinical trial. Based on Dan's preclinical work, we decided that if we use albumin mampaclitaxel, toxicity should be tolerable. And we decided to test six different dose levels going up to the dose level that is already approved for breast cancer, which is 260 milligrams per square meter. We're very nervous uh, initially, but we quickly got up to that dose level. And I can show you here some results from that, as opposed to the paper that Carpentier showed where there's a very small area of blood brain barrier opening. You can see here, we have a large areas of blood brain barrier opening. I'll, take, I'll walk you through these. This is the preoperative MRI. You can see the uh, enhancement. Uh, this is a, a dominant uh, temporal lobe tumor. I, I resected the tumor. This is my post-op scan. Uh, we do the implant. And then we wait two to three weeks because we want all the air to come out of the skull before we can do a good sonication. And I get a new baseline MRI because as you know, between scarring and tumor growth, there might be new enhancement two to three weeks after the MRI, uh, the initial resection is done. And you can see here now there's minimal enhancement around the, the resection cavity. We go in and in the infusion suite, this is done as an outpatient. We sonicate the brain, we infuse gadolinium, we infuse the uh, paclitaxel, and within an hour, we take a new MRI. And this MRI now shows all this enhancement around the resection cavity, which represents areas where the blood brain barrier has been open. 
Here's the second case, um, just to, to, to show you the same uh, principle with a different patient. I'm gonna skip the initial stop pre and post uh, operative MRI. Here's minimal amount of uh, enhancement two weeks after, but when you sonic it, you can see the enhancement is going even to the contralateral thalamus. It's, it's uh, really nice and we're up in the blood brain barrier. But does this translate into actual therapeutic levels of drugs in the brain? And, and to answer that, I did this intraoperative pharmacokinetic study. And, and the way that was done is I would and select patients where it was justified to remove peritumoral brain that was not enhancing. I exposed the brain, I implanted the device, I sonicated, I injected microbubbles, I injected fluorescein, and I injected paclitaxel. And then I waited 45 minutes. And then I did targeted biopsies. You can see right here, each of these wheels represents an area of the brain where the fluorescein leaked because of the ultrasound. And I would biopsy these and I would biopsy areas that weren't fluorescing. And I measured paclitaxel. Here's a, a video of, of one of my patients. You can see there's nine emitters. Each of them is fluorescing. The one in the center that has a strangler shape is where the tumor becomes superficial. So <coughs> fluorescence done by enhancing tumor, but also in the peritumoral brain that is not enhancing, you can get this fluorescent when you sonicate. Um, so and just move on from this video. So I did this and you can see this is, it's kind of an interesting dynamics. Fluorescent very quickly, it's cleared. You can see by 15 minutes, you have half of the concentration in the plasma. By 45 minutes, you have almost none. <clears throat> and so you see seven seconds after fluorescein injection, the whole brain is white. I'm sorry, it's yellow. And that's because it's in the capillary phase. You can see this vein that is not lighting up yet. 20 seconds, it's already in the venous phase. So you can see here fluorescein already clearing. But 15 minutes later, it's not in the parenchyma, it's not in, in the uh, intravascular compartment. It's only in the parenchyma that got sonicated. You see each of these wheels is an area that got sonicated and we opened the blood brain barrier. We found, I did this with paclitaxel, but I also did it with carboplatin as part of a different clinical trial. You see that we have a very nice correlation between paclitaxel and fluorescein concentration <coughs> in, the, um, uh, in the peritumoral brain. Uh, same thing with carboplatin. So fluorescein was now validated both in mice and humans as a way to visualize blood brain barrier opening by the ultrasound. And so the question then is, what are the effects of uh, blood brain barrier opening <coughs> on drug concentrations in the brain? So here's a, a case of mine as an example. It's a, a right frontal uh, recurrent glioblastoma where I did a right frontal lobectomy. Uh, I got stereotactically guided biopsies every time and I would disregard from the analysis any biopsy that was closer than a centimeter to enhancing tumor. So I did not want any contaminating uh, effects from enhancing disease. I really want to study the brain, not the, not the tumor. <clears throat> and so you can see here, the red represents non-sonicated brain. The green represents sonicated brain. And if you measure the carboplatin concentrations, there's a ninefold increase when you sonicate versus when you do not sonicate. Uh, but this is just one patient. What happens if you analyze multiple patients? Here, B represents an analysis of uh, seven patients from my trial that where I did this with paclitaxel. I have about a 3.7-fold increase in absolute paclitaxel concentration, 3.6-fold increase when you do brain-to-plasma paclitaxel ratios. But somebody might ask me, well, how do you know this is not, you know, you're taking biopsies and the biopsies have blood in them. How do you know it's not, blood contamination that is causing these results. I washed the, each specimen as best as I could with a liter of saline. I use new instruments every time, but it's still a valid question. So to answer that, what I did is I actually measured hemoglobin on the same specimen as I measured uh, the chemotherapy. And what you can see right here is hemoglobin is no different. So I don't think blood contamination is the, is the reason why these levels are so different between sonicated and that. Same thing happens with <coughs> carboplatin. Carboplatin, actually, the levels are much better. They're almost a six-fold increase. One thing you should know between paclitaxel and carboplatin, paclitaxel molecular weight is three times larger than carboplatin. So maybe there's something to a molecular weight. It's hard to know. The, the numbers are not big enough for me to, to know why this difference. But 
the, the take home message is you can increase the concentrations of these drugs in the human brain of multiple drugs anywhere between four to six fold by using this approach. And so the question is, how is the blood brain barrier reacting to that? And I'm sorry, I see that this is a little pixelated, um, but you know, if you're doing all this damage to, to the endothelium and the patients are tolerating this well and the blood brain barrier closes really quickly, how is this happening? So to answer that question, I started doing single cell RNA sequencing of the same brain specimens that I was uh, uh, measuring drugs in. <clears throat> and I focused on the endothelial cells, because as you know, those are the key components of the blood brain barrier. So I, I isolated about 2,500 endothelial cells from sonicated and non-sonicated uh, specimens. This is an analysis of six patients. Every patient had a paired sonicated and non-sonicated brain specimen. And you can see here the endothelium of sonicated specimens is localized down here. If you look at gene expression patterns, the Yuma plot will show you there's a distinct gene expression signatures. <clears throat> and there's several themes that are altered, including regulation of endocytosis, blood vessel morphogenesis, cell matrix addition. This interesting uh, theme that is called abnormality of cerebral vasculature. You know, I, I thought this was interesting because the computer, the gene ontology analysis knew I was dealing with blood vessels in the brain, which I thought was intriguing uh, from completely unbiased analysis. Transmembrane transporter activity, turns out there are several transmembrane transporters that were upregulated by this. And cell cell addition, which is key for tight and adherence junctions. This heat map represents in these cartoons each of the genes involved in this uh, gene ontology pathways. Many of them were shared across gene ontology pathways. <clears throat> but what's happening at the ultrastructural level? <clears throat> I love this project because it, it's taking me to places I've never really imagined. I would go as a neurosurgeon. I certainly was getting acquainted with electron microscopy pictures. And my, my trick to this, if you wonder, I'm no expert on single cell RNA sequencing or immunology or electron microscopy. I always find somebody smarter than me to, to give me some uh, you know, expertise. And so I found uh, electron microscopy experts and I, I, I had them photograph um, you know, about 15 or so uh, capillaries. But this time we did it at three time points. I did it eight, you know, four to eight minutes after sonication, I took biopsies. And then the 45 minutes at the time where I was getting the drug levels increased. And I also had the non-sonicated control. And in the preclinical literature, people have already shown that one of the potential mechanisms for the ultrasound to get drugs across the blood-brain barrier was to really transport these drugs through a cavioli. Cavioli are small vesicles that are mediated by CAV1. And so we measure cavioli. You can see here, each of these is a cavioli pit. I hope you can appreciate them. They have very distinctive features. And, and we can actually count those. And I had a postdoc uh, count one by one. This was a very laborious work. And he was able to, to count all of these. And when we do this, <clears throat> you can see the opposite of what was shown in preclinical models. We actually have a decrease in cavioli uh, within a few minutes of sonication. I think this is intuitive because we are actually stretching the, the, the cell membrane of endothelial cells. Maybe this will actually deform the, the membrane to the point where these cavioli disappear. These are imaginations of the cell membrane. So maybe this is what we were seeing. But what's clear to me is that cavioli is not really how the drugs are getting across the blood-brain barrier because they're decreased, they're not increased. The other surprising fact is that we found all these other vesicles that are not cavioli, hopefully you can appreciate them right here, but those actually were higher when you sonicate. And even more interestingly, <coughs> 45 minutes after sonication, they were even much higher than a few minutes after sonication. So this is really intriguing. I don't have proof that this is how drugs are getting across the blood-brain barrier, but I can tell you there's a mechanical trigger to blood-brain barrier opening, but something else happens after that that I think is molecular because this just keeps getting greater. There's, there's more of these vesicles 45 minutes after the mechanical intervention than immediately after the intervention. So something really intriguing is happening here. I don't have the total explanation for it, but I'm just sharing it as I, I observed. Uh, so I'm gonna conclude right here. I'm sorry, I might be uh, getting a little uh, beyond my time, but drug repurposing for glioblastoma therapy, I think is, 
a more humble and realistic way to go for an academic translational brain tumor researcher, particularly if you want to go through the whole motion from preclinical to clinical trial. Um, it's less risky uh, than a new agent development. Uh, I think if you're going to do that, it's, it's really important to confront the fact that glioblastomas are heterogeneous with response to therapy. And if you put that under the rock, it's going to bite you back when you do the clinical trial. You better embrace that from the beginning and study what makes some tumors susceptible and some others resistant and build that into your hypothesis. Investigation of biomarkers to produce so individual cases might, might improve your clinical trial design. <laughs> Um, and I would say with regards to biomarker development, the ideal biomarker should contribute to susceptibility, but also correlate with susceptibility. The other conclusions, drug delivery to the peritumoral brain where the blood brain barrier intact is, is essentially necessary. And the ultrasound, the blood brain barrier opening can enhance the penetration of drugs to, to large areas of the brain safely and repeatedly. And I think the next slide is, is the most important one. Obviously, I'm here speaking on behalf a lot of people who have put a lot of, I would say, blood, uh, sweat, and tears uh, to get this work done. I only represent them, but this is amazing work by done a lot of by a lot of people in my lab. My partner in, in crime with the ultrasound project is Roger Stook. We could not wish for a, a better, more established, but also more proactive uh, partner who gets his hands dirty in spite of any seniority. He, he will actually get down to writing protocols and, and, and doing all this work with me. And obviously the, the general support by the NCI, NINDS, uh, and, and philanthropic support uh, that I get at the institution. So with this, I think I, I will finish up. I don't know if I have, yeah, I forgot to put a nice picture of Chicago at the end, but uh, you can find that later. <laughs> well, thank you, that son of it. So amazing talk there was a lot of activity in the chat going back and forth different things um we did have a, a, a time for you to spend with the rest of it let's go ahead since it is really we bypassed that the next meeting that we have is with dr abori yama at 8 30 so i'm going to ask uh, we're going to have to bring you in person next time to meet with the residents but i was communicating so what i like to do is i want to take two questions and then uh and then we can move on to the next so if you can drop that slide and Andres is going to put another slide right there. I don't know, that'll be great. And, slide, and, and Andres, as I'm taking two questions, um, I'm going to take two questions from the audience. They were, I think that the first person that was asking me is uh, Dr. Garcia. Dr. Garcia, you want to ask your question. Keep them brief because we have three minutes and then I want to, I want to move on to meeting some of the faculty. Yes, sir. So my, my question is, uh, thank you. First of all, Dr. Sala, thank you very much for sharing your research with us this morning. Outstanding work and very inspiring. My question was in regards to that paper that you showed on Nature Medicine, do you think that the fact that all patients got the PD-1 uh, the treatment could have been a selection bias for the results that you got? I mean, I don't think so, because what we were asking on the Nature Medicine paper is what makes the patients that live long after PD-1 different than the ones that do not live long after PD-1. So we, you buy, for this question, you need all patients to get PD-1. On the Nature Cancer paper, to understand whether this is predictive or prognostic, we have an equal size cohort of patients who are very similar, but did not get PD-1 blockage. So I don't understand why this would be biased. Thank you, sir. And, and just to enhance, and then I'm gonna take another question from Ana Carrano, who I think is still here, but. Uh, Adam, one of the challenges, of course, in this work, and I think that you alluded to at the beginning, is our own skeptics. You see some of the modest results in, the, um, in rodents, and then you wonder if this is going to work, yes or no. I think the biomarkers question is crucial. And I, the more I think about it in the latest set of grants that we're doing, we're trying to figure out which patients will benefit from whatever therapy you have, because this, this is so heterogeneous and, uh, and difficult. And, and of course, as a young faculty like yourself, you realize you crack the code and how to get grants. Mm -hmm. Some of us do, you know, you have certainly done that. You know, I have certainly over the years. The question is how do you translate that work back to the patient? That is the journey that you are in right now. You realize that it's extraordinarily expensive. There's a lot of skepticism. It takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of patience, takes a big team. So having said that, I'm gonna go ahead and open it for that to Carrano. Go ahead, Anna, please. Uh, good morning and uh, really fascinating work and it's, it's amazing what you can do with the 
operating room and the lab together. So I have uh, actually two questions. The first question is like, how did you get started working with the patients like originally? Um, and then the second question, maybe that's quicker to answer is like, the sonication of the brain can only be done on like a superficial cortical levels or can it also be performed like on deeper areas, like maybe like closer to the ventricles because we do a lot of work with the lateral ventricles. Is that an option? Could it be an option or it's uh, not feasible? Sure. So I'll answer both questions uh, briefly. How I got started working with the patients, you know, this nature medicine paper we, we discussed it's basically, this was my clinical practice and I turned my disappointment and excitement into a research project. And this was not a clinical trial. This was basically starting to just annotate who did well, who didn't do well, and systematically investigate that without any bias. I use techniques that will just give you an answer without any preconceived hypothesis. So that was something you all can do, have clinical observations and come up with the rigor to study them systematically. The second part is obviously starting a clinical trial, which is, you know, I would say harder, a higher barrier to entry, but you can do it. And if you want to start a clinical trial, what I would say is think of a drug that is out there that has a compelling way to be studied in a clinical trial. But when you do the clinical trial, I would shy away from clinical endpoints. Forget about survival. Figure out if you can do a clinical trial in which you can see whether the drug is doing what it's supposed to be doing in the human brain. If you have that, then the other studies will follow. But if you go all the way to a survival and get a negative result and the drug wasn't even in the brain and wasn't doing what you thought would be doing, you really wasted 15 years of your career. Yes, totally agree. We are working on that. And then the, the answer on the second question, the ultrasound will go about eight or nine centimeters deep opening the blood brain barrier. We see it in the posterior. They're all, all the implants are supratentorial, but we see enhancement in the cerebellum, brainstem, posterior fossa. We see them in the contralateral side. I don't see any issue targeting the ventricles. Okay, well, thank you, Beautiful, awesome. Beautiful, Adam. Thank you, Anna, wonderful. Well, listen, we can go on and on in questions and stuff, but I do really do want you to at least spend a few minutes with the faculty. We thank you for your morning. You saw the plaque that Andres and Karen are gonna send you to your office. Hopefully when I come to visit you, we'll have it. Uh, We'll see it in your office right there is a uh, just a small token of appreciation for your time for your morning for the amazing work that you're doing and then i like to keep an invitation open for next year to have you here in person to spend the whole coming on sunday having dinner come in and join us on monday we have a research day with the residents a lot of talks you can see some of the work that a lot of people here are doing we didn't get a chance to get to Lear Boyaji. he was thinking about awake craniotomies I saw that from Miller he's thinking about interventional ways of delivering drugs and cells and all kinds of stuff so a lot of people that we didn't get into but this was just a teaser Excellent. to get people excited for you come next how is that I look forward thank you everyone Wonderful. thank you Alfredo for the invitation thank you Wonderful. a lot of people will stay here and then Andres he's going to be linking to another connection to start meeting with the faculty yeah, it's it's another link, and it's the same link for all meetings. So we'll jump in and out. Okay, uh, I'm going to leave this excellent. one and join the next one. Thanks, everybody. And yes, uh, sorry, and I'll see you in about an hour. All right. Thank you, Adam. Right. You got it. Bye bye. <laughs>